All right, so huge thank you to the Center for New American Security for hosting this. And uh, thank you to Paul for the very, very easy assignment. Um, how to talk about all regulations for AI in all sectors in 10 minutes. We're good? We're good? We're going to do it? All right. Um, so that's impossible, obviously. <laughs> what I can do is I can describe some of law's reactions, some of the way law deals with different kinds of legal disruptions uh, and their respective benefits and their respective drawbacks, when they're going to work, when they're not. And at the outset, it's important to start by recognizing that law is a tool for regulating human behavior, for trying to change human conduct in different ways. And, and any significant change in what hu human conduct is possible, say a political revolution or an economic shift, is going to change the law, is going to cause legal disruption and evolution. I study the interaction between law and new technology because this is a space where there tends to be dramatic shifts in what is possible for human beings to do uh, in short time periods and in entirely unanticipated ways. So it's a fascinating area of legal disruption. And law has three major ways of responding to these disruptions. At one end of the spectrum, one of the most extreme responses is to ban it. If we don't have the new technology, we don't have to deal with the new conduct that it enables. Uh, and this is a very popular, sometimes knee-jerk response when there's a new technology that has different uh, muddy ethical issues associated with it, when there's a new technology that has dangers that are not well understood. Um, and there are a lot of benefits to bans. Right? Not all innovation is necessarily good, and there's a lot of benefit to having some breathing space to step back and pause and think of, and better understand a new technology before releasing it into the wild. Um, the issue with bans is that they're not always going to be effective. And I've done some pretty extensive studies of the history of weapon bans, trying to figure out what makes a ban more or less likely to be effective. And I found that effective bans, successful bans, are correlated with, with two major factors. One is the architecture of the technology that's being regulated, and whether or not there is some bottleneck that can be controlled, say the materials necessary or the expertise necessary for creating or acquiring that technology, uh, and also whether or not the architecture of the technology allows for violations to be identified. One of the other aspects that's really determinative of whether or not a ban is going to be successful is what conduct that new technology enables. So certain conduct, uh, well, certain rather, certain technologies simply allow human beings to do something, to accomplish an aim more effectively than anything else. And in certain circumstances, those, those kinds, that kind of conduct and the technology that enables it are, is going to be very, very difficult to ban. Um, there is a drawback. There are a couple drawbacks with bans. One is that it's a very broad regulatory approach, uh, and it risks it risks taking off the table potentially beneficial new technology. So I don't think anybody in this room thinks it's going to be possible to ban AI generally. Um, and there's, it's not even clear that we'd want to. There's so many potential benefits associated with it. But there is a question uh, and an ongoing debate about whether or not it's going to be possible or we should ban certain applications, certain kinds of artificial intelligence, particularly in war fighting. Okay, so and bans, at the, bans one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, we have the opposite legal approach, uh, which is doing nothing, waiting and seeing. Stepping back, trying to understand the technology that you, know, you might consider regulating at a later date, letting the market work it out, seeing what happens when there's a problem using law by analogy to try and address it. Um, there are benefits associated with this too, right? It, it promotes innovation, avoids overbroad regulation. Uh, there's also huge drawbacks. One thing that I like to remind industry actors is there's no such thing as no regulation. There's early regulation and there's late regulation, but believe me, regulation happens, right? And, and, regula and late regulation, sometimes counterintuitively, can be far more strict than early regulation. So take the Tesla example that we talked about earlier, right? Sometimes when you have an accident involving a new technology that's particularly dramatic, you're going to get responsive lawmaking that's overbroad and strict. 
in response to that accident in a way that might not have happened if you had ex ante lawmaking or rulemaking uh, imposing staf safety standards that would have prevented that accident or determined liability in response to that accident. Um, other issues with uh, taking the wait and see approach is that it really risks difficult to remedy damage or sometimes impossible to remedy damage. Uh, we basically took a wait and see approach towards much of the last industrial revolution that resulted in a huge amount of worker, in I'm sorry, worker injury uh, as well as a huge amount of pollution that to this day is very difficult to address. So one question worth asking is what will be the negative side effects of an AI industrial revolution? Who is going to be harmed? What is the resource that we currently think of as inexhaustible that is actually exhaustible? Okay, so on one side, ban. On the other side, take a wait and see approach. Somewhere in the middle is a Goldilocks solution. Uh, the, the idea of proactively creating new law to try and address specific problems. Um, and this kind of direct, this could take a couple different forms. Direct regulation happens on a spectrum of tech neutral lawmaking and tech specific lawmaking. Uh, tech specific lawmaking is usually done to address a specific problem associated with a specific technology. So you can imagine maybe a law that sentencing algor algorithms need to be interpretable and explainable so that individuals can challenge them and have a basis for challenging them. Uh, direct laws can also be more tech neutral to preserve an overarching goal or, or an overarching principle. So you can imagine a requirement uh, that machine learning training sets don't have bias. Good luck with that, but you can imagine something tech neutral, a, law, a tech neutral law like that. There's going to be trade offs on this tech neutral, tech specific spectrum. The more tech neutral a law is, the more future proof it is, right? The more it's going to apply to different kinds of new technologies as they arise in advance, uh, and it's going to protect certain norms ahead of time. This happens a lot with customary international humanitarian law. Uh, the problem is, the trade-off is with flexibility comes interpretability and changeability. And so one aspect of tech neutral law is it actually puts the power of enforcement of that law in the hands of the interpreters, the later date interpreters. So it's going to be the judges or the states interpreting the law that are going to actually determine what it is. When you have a tech specific law, it keeps the power in the hands of the rule maker, right? The legislator or the agency, um, and uh, uh, possibly even the industry, if it's the industry is the one making the rule. So trade-offs between tech neutral and tech specific. One thing that's not always recognized is how law can operate indirectly to regulate. Um, and it does through, it can do this through regulating, creating benefits, creating incentives, creating punishments uh, that affect different regulatory forces. So one example is you can use law to foster the development of new norms. You can require industries to create codes of conduct and publish them and then hold them accountable to those codes of conduct. You can use law to require specific technical design features in a new technology. Um, for example, require any AI system to meet certain safety standards before its release or its marketing. Um, you can also, this is a popular one, uh, you can use law uh, to influence the market, to create market-based market, market -based means of changing incentives. You can have tax incentives and tax breaks for research in certain areas, uh, provide grants for certain kinds of research, or on the back end impose fines for certain kinds of problems, certain violations. So you use law to change the market to influence different actors. Uh, so as you might have gathered through my tone, I, I believe in the power of proactive lawmaking. I, I have to acknowledge there are some drawbacks uh, to this Goldilocks approach as well. Uh, first, obviously, it's not possible to anticipate all the problems ahead of time. And when you're trying to imagine and focus on one, you, you risk wasting resources on an issue that might never actually arise. This happened with the international community. Uh, it spent a lot of time on cloud seeding and weather modification treaties uh, and anticipating a kind of technology that, that never really manifested. Um, and while you're focusing on these problems, or 
trying to get energy, trying to get excitement about a problem that hasn't happened yet is very difficult. So it's just simply hard to enact proactive regulations because there's not a lot of momentum behind it when you, when you don't have the concrete accident that you are responding to. Uh, but there's obviously a huge amount of benefits to this kind of regulation. It really allows for one to use the law to channel the development of technology in socially beneficial ways, in proactive ways to preserve certain principles or protect vulnerable populations. Uh, so the main takeaway I'd like to leave you with is that law is a tool made by humans to guide human conduct. Like any tool, it can be well or poorly made, and like any tool, it can be used for good or bad purposes. Uh, but it's not handed down on high, it evolves, it changes, and uh, what, you want, what, you, what laws you want to have are going to depend on the architecture of the technology you want to regulate and the specific problems you'd like to address. <laughs>